let us start uh, phase transformations in detail using the example of solidification of a pure metal. This is uh, indeed a uh, simple illustrative examples, but some of the important points we note here are applicable to other kind of phase transformations as well. Uh, this, or, this is a first order phase transformation, though here we are not defining or in detail what is meant by the order of a transformation. And, uh, but the important point we need to note is that such first order phase transformations involve nucleation and growth. That means, the phase transformation has two steps, one is nucleation, another is growth. And what is meant by this nucleation and what is growth, we will see in, in considerable detail very soon. Since we are talking about solidification of a pure metal, there is no change in composition involved. And, uh, uh, this on the other hand suppose I solidify a met alloy, it could also mean that uh, we have already seen the isomorphic phase diagram, there is a continuous change in compositions uh, into the two phase region and therefore, it will involve long range diffusion. But in the simple example, there is no long range diffusion, just we are talking about nucleation and growth and uh, we will see some illustrative figures to understand this a little more detail. Uh, strain energy term can be neglected, we have seen the strain energy term, we have understood the origin of that strain energy term, but we can safely neglect that term here, because we are working at constant temperature and pressure. And this is a liquid to solid phase transformation and therefore, we need not talk about strain energy and this can be safely neglected from the Gibbs free energy of the process. This process obviously, can start only below the melting point, because only below the melting point is the free energy of the liquid lower than that of the solid. In other words, there is at all any propensity for the system to solidify. And this automatically implies we have to use undercool the system that means, we have to take it below the bulk melting point and this phenomena or this process is called undercooling. And as we shall see later and uh, maybe we can, we can note now that uh, under suitable conditions melts can be undercooled to a large extent without solidification taking place. That means, suppose I take a molten pool of nickel and I take it below its melting point. I can keep on cooling it to a lower and lower temperatures and if there is no, uh, for instance suppose this is done under zero gravity conditions and you do not have a container in which it is held, and under such circumstances it is been possible to you know under cool systems uh, more than 100 degrees Celsius. So, we have to understand the mystery that why is such under cooling possible, is not it that below the melting point the material should solidify or the more fundamental question is the melting point also the freezing point and some of these things we will understand very soon. Now, I pointed out that this nucleation and growth process involves for instance, suppose I am talking about an alpha to beta phase transformation or in the present case a liquid to solid phase transformation involves nucleation of a solid phase for instance and the growth of the phase till the alpha phase is exhausted that would complete my phase transformation. And therefore, such a phase transformation uh, can be thought of as nucleation followed by growth. Now, why do we have to actually uh, you know split this process into two steps, one involving the term called nucleation, one involving the term called growth and in this context let me point out the term nucleation is a technical term. So, to understand this process let us uh, see the uh, solidification of stearic acid from an undercooled melt. Initially what happens of course, there is a liquid pool here and this whole region is a liquid and in this liquid pool you will notice that there are small regions of crystalline phase forming. So, this is my crystalline uh, stearic acid, there is also a small crystal here and there is a crystal at another crystal here and this crystal grows if we wait long enough. Here of course, we are doing a solidification experiment in which of course, the system is being cooled and we are not at a constant temperature, we are just cooling the system and allowing solidification to take place, but this is an illustrative a nice example to understand how a two phase mixture can coexist at any point of time. So, at any point of time you can notice that there is a solid phase here, there is a solid phase in this region, there is a solid phase in this region, but then there is also this liquid pool which exists here. So, the liquid and solid phase uh, are coexistent at this point of time and as you progress in time, so this is step 1 in time, this is step 2 in time, you go to step 3 in time, you would notice that, that some of the crystallites grow and join and they lead to the formation of a green boundary, because now this is a boundary between two crystals and that can be called a green boundary. Parallelly, you can notice that some of the pre existing crystallites grew, but new crystallites are also forming. That means, for instance, in this region you would have noticed a crystallite which has formed, here a new nucleus is forming as we are seeing in figure number 4 and this nucleus at a later point of time grows. 
slowly you would notice that as we are waiting long enough and of course, we are also falling in temperature the cooling experiment then most of the liquid melt has got transformed into solid. So, now in figure number 6 you would notice that all these are crystals now. So, this is crystal this is another crystal and this is another crystal and most of the liquid phase is gone away and we have many many green boundaries between these crystalline regions which are all single crystals, but separated from other such single crystals by a boundary as shown in schematically in figure 4. So, it is clear that phase transformation is taking place from the liquid to solid and if you are cooling the system uh, below the uh, melting point then you would notice that the diffraction of the solid is increasing with time. A important point to note is that here we are seeing an increasing time experiment and soon we will be talking about increasing under cooling experiment. So, we will have to be very very careful that when it is just a schematic to understand the point that how solid and liquid phase coexist, how a nucleation of a second phase uh, the solid phase takes place or the crystal takes place in the melt, how such crystallites grow in the melt and how finally, they join together to finally form an entire as in picture 6 almost a completely a solid crystal crystalline phase of course, this is a polycrystal. The reason for choosing stearic acid of course, is a low melting compound and added to the fact that uh, it is also transparent. So, that uh, we can easily see the growth of these dendrites and uh, this dendritic kind of solidification. So, a schematic of this process is shown in the figure on the right hand side that you have the liquid then at a lower uh, at increasing time you have solid phase forming and with the crystalline phase which is coexisting with the liquid and finally, of course, you have a polycrystalline solid as in the bottom most figure here. So, you have a polycrystalline solid here okay. and as I told you all this can only happen if you are below the melting point in other words if you under cool the system. Of course, you could co go on cooling the system as in the current experiment or you could hold it at a constant under cooling and wait for uh, and see that what happens. So, this is a schematic with which or a actual experiment carried out, but uh, as an illustrative example we have considered this. Now, let us uh, see talk about the uh, liquid to solid phase transformation in more detail and we know that below the melting point the solid phase becomes more stable the liquids free energy is lower than the solids free energy. If you see the diagram below this is the melting point T m above the melting point it is the liquids free energy which is lower and above the below the melting point is the solids free energy which is lower. So, this is of course, the definition of the melting point itself. So, liquid is stable on the right hand side the blue region in the figure and the solid is stable below the melting point in the region shaded pink. Now, suppose I am at a certain intercooling that means, I am at a certain temperature which I can call T 1 and at this T 1 temperature here. I can note that that means, I am at a certain under cooling that means, somehow I have instantaneously gone from the molten solid say above the melting point somewhere here at this temperature to a temperature T 1 where I am under a certain under cooling may be I can subscript it as delta T 1. Now, at this delta T 1 the liquid free energy is here the solids free energy is here that means, I have a benefit if this liquid transforms into solid I have a benefit of delta G subscript V course, this is the the subscript V indicates that I am under cooling I mean this is the volume free energy that means, per unit volume of the material how much free energy benefit I get when the solidification takes place. Now, the important point is that even if you are just below the melting point solidification does not start this is something which we will talk about in detail in the coming slides, but if suppose I am at this T 1 which is at delta T 1 under cooling solidification does not start. In fact, liquid nickel has been under cooled to about 250 degree Celsius below the melting point under suitable conditions. Why is that systems get under cooled so much? Why what is that which is sort of impeding the solidification? These are the questions we will try to understand in the coming slides. And as we have seen here that the whole reason that the uh, liquid needs to turn into a solid is this delta G V term which we have considered at an under cooling of delta T 1. That means, I am at un under cooling delta T 1 there is propensity for the system to lower its Gibbs free energy by forming a crystalline solid from the melt. Now, we will try to understand this term nucleation in lot more detail because it is a technical term and uh, we have to understand the full meaning of this. An important point in this context is that that nucleation itself comes in two forms the homogeneous nucleation 
and the heterogeneous nucleation. Um, at the beginning of this chapter, we had done the experiment and we had in which we had taken a aerated drink and we had opened the bottle and poured the aerated drink into the glass. Anybody who had done this experiment had would have noticed that the bubbles tend to form at the glass walls or at the interface between the straw and the uh, aerated drink. And further we had done in that experiment that we had taken the uh, some salt and put it into the uh, into the aerated drink and we found that lot of vigorous fizzing that means lot of evolution of gas takes place. Now, in that case why is this kind of a nucleation where there is a mold wall or a straw or some kind of a solid we are putting into the liquid these are all called heterogeneous nucleation sites. Okay. That means, there is some second phase involved or a second kind of a entity involved and that kind of a nucleation there is some preferred sites where the parent phase the nucleation of the product phase can take place preferentially. Okay. So, that is what is called uh, uh, heterogeneous nucleation. On the other hand homogeneous nucleation uh, the probability of the nucleation occurring in the parent phase is throughout the same that means that there is no preferred site. If I take a liquid melt for instance held in say 0 gravity conditions and suppose it forms a spherical ball that means any point in this liquid uh, of course, the surface could be preferred, but any side any point inside the liquid would have a equal probability of forming a nucleation site. On the other hand suppose I talk about, take about a, a molten melt in a container or uh, for instance, in this e example we saw before that I am actually solidifying this uh, stearic acid between two glass plates. Therefore, the lick the mold melt glass interface could be a preferential site. There could also be some impurity or some kind of a small particles within this uh, um, you know the melt which also act can act like preferential sites and the presence of such preferential sites we call this as heterogeneous nucleation. In liquid to solid phase transformations the walls of the container inclusions in the melt etcetera can be preferential nucleation sites or heterogeneous nucleation sites. And if you are talking about a solid to solid phase transformation then very many types of uh, heterogeneous nucleation sites can occur these include inclusions, green boundaries, dislocations, stacking faults etcetera. So, all these can play the role of an heterogeneous nucleating agent. So, let us start with this uh, phenomena called homogeneous nucleation and first we will give a textbook description of nucleation before uh, taking up an alternate perspective as to how I can understand this mystery of undercooling and um, the definition of melting point. Okay. So, assuming that I am at a fixed undercooling delta t and that means I am not slowly cooling the melt I am at a fixed undercooling or a fixed temperature below the melting point and let me consider the formation of a spherical crystal of radius r from the melt and we are also neglecting the strain energy contribution to the overall change in Gibbs free energy and the free energy change let us consider to is to be delta g. This is now equal to the decrease in the bulk free energy plus the Gibbs free energy plus an increase in the surface free energy. And this can be these values can be computed for a spherical nucleus because now we are considering a spherical nucleus r which is forming from the melt. So, let me draw this on the board. So, I am at a fixed undercooling delta t. and under these conditions I am assuming that a nucleus of radius r forms. Assume that a spherical nucleus of radius r forms and Therefore, there are two terms energy terms involved for computing the overall delta g for this whole process. So, for this spherical nucleus I can consider the reduction in overall bulk free energy is delta g v into the volume of the spherical nucleus. The increase in interface energy gamma is uh, the surface area multiplied by the gamma term since we are already neglecting the for this liquid to solid phase transformation the strain energy term. So, delta g can be written as the green term which is supporting my whole phase transformation process the term in red box which is opposing my phase transformation or the solidification process and therefore, delta g can be written as 4 by 3 pi r cube into delta g v because this is now a spherical nucleus and the volume of this nucleus is 4 by 3 pi r cube and 4 pi r square which is the surface area 
of this spherical nucleus multiplied by the surface free energy term which is gamma. Now, of course, delta G V is negative that means, it is helping the process gamma is a this second term is positive that means, it is opposing the process. This delta G V needless to say as we have noted before is a function of the undercooling that means, it is not a constant term it depends this in this as we noted in this graph before thus delta G V suppose I go to a further undercooling here. So, uh, to undercooling not delta T 1, but I go to an undercooling delta T 2. Now, my Gibbs free energy benefit at this temperature happens to be this term which is here. So, this becomes my new change. So, this becomes delta G V at an undercooling delta T 2. So, this delta G V is at delta G V as a function which is now at delta T T 1. So, this delta G V term is obviously a function of the undercooling and that is what we have stated here as delta G V is a function of the undercooling. Since, we are working at a fixed undercooling and for a fixed undercooling I can write an equation as the equation 1 here which is the green equation in green shade. Now, an important point is that that means, there is one negative term there is one positive term both of them depend on the radius both are polynomial functions of the radius one of these functions differs from the other by an one order of magnitude that means, one is an r cube term one is an r square term. Now, suppose I plot an r cube and r square functions. So, this is f of r now which could be r cube or r square the polynomial and I func plot it as function of r we know that the smaller power dominates for values of r below 1. If you take a value below 1 it is a smaller power which is r square term which dominates for a power larger than 1 it is actually the higher power which dominates. And here we already know that the r cube term is a negative term because that is what is supporting here as in this case and the r square term is the positive term when the coefficient is to these terms as shown here are positive and negative respectively. That implies that when I am subtracting this one r cube term from the other term my minus r cube plus r square I would expect such a function to be a not monotonic in R and we would notice that if you plot this function this function actually goes through a maxima. So, let us consider this in a little more detail because uh, so what we are saying here is that the delta G term for the whole phase transformation at a constant under cooling delta T is a function of two terms one which depends as R cube the other depends as R square and we have noted that the R cube term would dominate after a value of 1 and r square below value of 1 and of course, but in this case of course, there are other uh, factors which are multiplied with this r cube. So, therefore, there is a scaling factor and the important point to note is that that such functions are found in many many circumstances and in there, but the important thing is that depending on which term is positive and which term is negative this function would either go through this kind of functions like suppose you could have a term like wherein one term opposes you like it would be positive or negative and therefore, this uh, say this function of r can be 1 power of n and the n multiplied by coefficient c 1 plus another power of n multiplied by coefficients say n plus 1 or even it could be n plus 2 for instance this could also be n plus 2. So, there are two differing powers say one of them is c 1 could be positive other one could be negative or other way about. But the important point is that when you have two such functions the sum of these two functions can undergo either a maxima or a minima. So, this is an important point to note because now when one is uh, positive other is negative and in the present case if I note if I am writing the term like for instance suppose I write down a function of x minus x square which is the dotted line here this x minus x square goes through a maxima. If I other way talk about another function x square minus x which is the opposite function this will go through a minimum. Now, how is this physically very very important? It is physically very very important because now we had if you had a function like delta g which is going to tell me what is going to be the stable state and I am seeing a function which goes through a minima. that means the system if suppose this is a starting point of the system with a certain r equal to 0 such a system will go downhill and gives free energy come to the minima and there the system will tend to be at its stable state. But suppose I am talking about a function like in the current case which is now 
a negative r cube term with a positive r square term then such functions which is similar to now for the r minus r square kind of thing term will go through a maxima. That implies now suppose this is not function of x I am actually plotting the Gibbs free energy such a function the moment any change in r takes place increase in r takes place the system is going uphill in Gibbs free energy. So, this is the important point and we will return to it in the coming slides in the context of uh, this uh, solidification, but uh, to summarize this slide what we are saying here is that if the functions go through a minima then there is no confusion such a system will evolve in r and finally, settle down in the minima, but suppose the system goes through a maxima then things are not that obvious and we will have to consider that how such a transformation will take place in which the very first step in the transformation formation of say a small r will actually take you above in Gibbs free energy. So, this is the thick question we are asking and we will try to un answer this in this question in this slide. Now that means, the delta g versus r plot will go through a maximum given the fact that gamma is a positive term and the delta g v term is a negative term. Now, this implies suppose I form suddenly a, a small crystallite of say for, for instance this is my small crystallite forming of a certain radius say r 1 a very small radius here. Now, this crystallite of this very small size here has taken my system uphill in Gibbs free energy. The Gibbs free energy is increasing as you can see along the blue curve and then decreasing later of course, but the point is that now the system is growing to increase in Gibbs free energy. What will be the tendency now of such a small crystallite? The crystallite will tend to shrink and dissolve because now dissolve implying it will tend to remelt back sorry the term should have been remelt, but I have used the term dissolve, but what exactly it means here is that the tendency would be to melt. Now, if the small r 1 crystallite is going to melt back that means that there is no chance that transformation can take place because now obviously, if, if a small crystallite has to form it cannot be a large crystallite which can form immediately, but a small piece in the whole melt which will be forming a crystallite and this solid crystal would dissolve away. And therefore, you can see that automatically that there is some kind of a barrier to this crystallization process that means, the formation of a small crystallite is not preferred in Gibbs free energy. Now, let us carry forward the mathematical aspects of this before we understand the physical aspects. I have seen that this curve actually goes through a maxima and then goes through a point where it becomes 0. So, it, there are two zeros, one trivially at in the molten state where there are no crystallites, one where the crystallite size is r 0 which I labeled as r 0. So, I can find these two values the maxima corresponds to dou delta g by dou r equal to 0 and by setting dou delta g by dou r is equal to 0 I can find that there is a radius r star at which the maxima takes place and that r star can be computed to be minus 2 gamma by delta g v and the Gibbs free energy corresponding to this value of r star is delta g star which can be found to be 16 by 3 pi gamma cube by delta g v square. In other words both r star and uh, gamma delta g star are functions of gamma and delta g v. So, the maxima of this plot can be computed using d delta g by d r is equal to 0 and the maxima it corresponds to a value of r star delta g star and these two values can be computed by setting d delta g by d delta star equal to 0. Now, the important point is that suppose now let me consider somehow a crystallite which is of the size r star forms. So, this is my crystallite of r star which forms which is bigger than the crystallite size shown here for instance this size. So, they suppose this is r 2 it is bigger than r 1 it is bigger than r 2, but it is of the size of r star. Now, suppose a crystallite of r star size form somehow then it can actually then reduce the Gibbs free energy by growing downhill in this plot. So, it can actually decrease the Gibbs free energy by going downhill in plot though the formation of r star itself has taken place uphill in Gibbs free energy, 
but further after it is reached the top of the hill it can actually go downhill of course there are two options it can also melt back but there is one option here in which case it can go downhill in Gibbs free energy by growing. So, there is a possibility of growth if I somehow assemble a crystallite of size r star of course, how we can ask this question how does this assemblage take place and technically this is called uh, these are referred to as statistically statistical random fluctuations which lead to such kind of nucleus that means, what we are implying is that the solid is actually exploring many configuration the liquid state is exploring many configurations and some of these configurations resemble the crystalline state. We will have a little more to talk about that later on, but for now we will assume that somehow an R star has formed and it can grow downhill in Gibbs free energy. Now, sizes of crystallite smaller than R star are called embryos that means, these are embryos which are smaller than R star. The R star is called a critical size nuclei, sizes greater than R star are called super critical nuclei. So, embryos will tend to remelt back into the uh, liquid state, super critical nuclei will tend to grow and cause further solidification that means, they will become bigger and bigger and therefore, they will a single supercritical nuclei can itself grow and cause the entire uh, liquid to become crystalline solid state. Now, actual reduction if we observe in the Gibbs free energy takes place only after we cross a size which is R 0 and we can find R 0 by setting delta G is equal to 0 and if we set delta G equal to 0 we find that the value of R 0 turns out to be 3 minus 3 gamma by delta G V while R star is minus 2 gamma by delta G V R 0 is minus 3 gamma by delta G V. So, to summarize this slide we are now talking about a delta G V function delta G function for the process which has two terms the term which is opposing us the gamma term and when we plot one of them depends on R cube here and the other term depends on R square when you plot this function this function goes through a maxima we can find the maxima by setting delta G by del d r equal to 0 and we find that that maxima corresponds to a r star labeled r star which is minus 2 gamma by delta G V. This corresponds to a Gibbs free energy increase the important term is increase of 16 pi by 3 gamma cube by delta G V square. Now, by somehow if I form an, uh, a nuclei of r star then this can grow and become super critical and cause solidification to take place. Clearly, this implies that the process of nucleation is uphill in Gibbs free energy and the process of growth is downhill in Gibbs free energy. So, now we have a clear cut definition of nucleation and growth nucleation is this process taking place starting from 0 to R star which is uphill in Gibbs free energy and any process taking place which takes a critical nuclei to supercritical nuclei is called a, a growth which is happening downhill in Gibbs free energy. So, we now understand what is the term of nucleation of growth and in this context there is another term which will come perhaps important is this term called coarsening, but we will not consider that term here in more detail. Now, we have to ask ourselves what is the effect of undercooling we have said that because delta G V is already a function of undercooling. So, what is the effect of undercooling delta T on R star and delta G star. So, we have noted that at larger undercooling delta G V increases and this implies R star and delta G star decrease. So, suppose I am at an undercooling which is originally shown by this red curve here this is a part for a particular undercooling. Now, suppose I increase my delta G V that means, I go to larger undercoolings like in the curve be before I am not at this one this temperature del T 1, but I am at a lower temperature T 2 which corresponds to delta T 2. Now, at such a larger undercooling we would note that that R star would decrease delta G star would decrease because the delta G in both cases is situated in the denominator that means, my curve would tend to become this curve for larger undercoolings. And needless to say suppose at the melting point T m uh, delta G V is store uh, 0 and that implies R star is infinity because at the melting point there is no propensity for formation of solid and this implies that my <coughs> R star goes to infinity 
and this implies solidification cannot take place, which also is makes it very clear that the melting point is not the same as the freezing point. That means, for freezing to take place, we have to undercool the system. And this G barrier to nucleation is often referred to as the nucleation barrier. This maxima is referred to as the nucleation barrier. And more and more undercool, the R star keeps on decreasing, and because of this function that minus 2 G uh, minus 2 gamma by delta G V, and this implies at larger and larger undercoolings there is a better chance of solidification. Now, why is it a better chance? Because now the way the R star appears, the solid of a certain size appears is by a statistical random fluctuations okay. and such kind of fluctuations uh, it is easier to assemble uh, an R star which is smaller than an R star which is larger. So, this is an important point to note here that now we introduce the concept of nucleation, we have introduced the concept of a nucleation barrier and we have seen that at larger undercooling there is a better chance of a nucleus of R star forming because now we have R star value decreases and that also means that solidification would become easier at larger undercoolings. Now, we have used a term called statistical random fluctuation, let us try to get a physical picture of what is happening. In other words, how does this R star come about? To cause nucleation or an even an embryo atoms of the liquid which are randomly moving about have to come together in an order which resembles the crystalline order at a given instant of time. So, I have a liquid here right in the schematic below in which atoms are randomly arranged here as in the picture, but at some instant of time I expect that one of the configurations being explored or being found in some region of the liquid is like the one which is shown in green and this is like the crystalline order and this has occurred randomly and it if this R which I am drawing here is below the R star then this such a random order would melt away uh, such an ordered region would melt away, but then the liquid will try to explore some other region. So, we are assuming that we are without T m and we are at it say for instance a fixed under cooling delta T 1. Now, there will be certain other region again this kind of crystalline order may appear and if this crystalline order becomes larger then the uh, that means reaches R star then such a crystalline order can grow. Now, this crystalline order is very different from the local order which exists in the liquid this is obvious because the liquid perhaps is highly disordered and this crystalline order is very very different. This coming together to form this order which is statistical in nature that means that the liquid is exploring locally many different possible configurations and that too randomly and in some location in the liquid this order may resemble the preferred crystalline order. Since this is the process is random and statistical in nature the probability that a larger side crystallite is assembled is lower than that a smaller side crystallite of a preferred order is assembled. So, this is the important thing which we are talking about. So, hence at small undercoolings where the value of R star is large the chance of formation of a supercritical nucleus is small and so the probability of solidification as at least one nucleus need is needed which can further grow to cause solidification of the entire mint. At larger undercoolings where R star is relatively smaller the chance of solidification is higher which is what we see schematically here. Suppose I am plotting R star for different undercoolings say suppose I am at undercooling 1 here and this is my R star which I need to assemble at a larger undercooling this R star decreases and even larger undercooling. So, delta T is increasing down and R star is decreasing down and therefore, it is easier for me to assemble this kind of an R star rather than this kind of an R star at a higher undercooling. Therefore, I observe that probability of solidification is higher because at least I need to form one nucleus which is super which can become super critical and cause the solidification of the entire mint. So, at the heart of all this uh, process is this kind of fluctuations which is taking place in the liquid state and some of those fluctuations is giving rise to a green region shown in this graph which is like a crystalline order and which can further grow to cause solidification of the melt. Now, let us consider an alternate perspective of what is meant by this nucleation barrier okay. and we will see that in some sense that this perspective will sort of help us sort of get rid of the mystery of what is uh, 
why this nucleation barrier should exist or how we can alternately understand that there is actually a different way of understanding why melting or solidification becomes easier at larger undercooling. To, to understand this question, so we will ask ourselves this question what is meant by melting point and what is meant by undercooling. So, these are two important questions. Okay. Now, suppose I take the example of say for instance gold nanoparticles and here I got gold nanoparticles of various sizes and I am plotting the melting point of these gold nanoparticles with size. So, the plot below shows melting point of gold nanoparticles plotted as a function of the particle radius. Now, it is to be noted that the melting point of nanoparticles decrease below the bulk melting point. So, the bulk melting point of large polycrystalline pieces say suppose I take a big chunk of gold and try to see its melting point is somewhere around 1064 degrees Celsius ok. That is the melting point of the bulk. So, this is T m bulk this is the bulk melting point. Now, with respect to this bulk melting point if I track the melting point of all these nano crystals. I would notice that nano crystals of smaller and smaller sizes melt at lower and lower temperatures. And that means that the melting point is lower than the bulk melting point. For example, a 5 nanometer particle melts more than 100 degrees below the bulk melting point. This is due to surface effects and we have already noted that surface is a region where the bonds are unsaturated. That means that the surface region atoms are not as well bonded and we already explored what is called the broken bond model where we see that the surface atoms there are some bonds which are unsatisfied and these atoms perhaps have a what you call a freedom to move more than the bulk atoms. So, because of these surface effects we do expect crudely speaking and we will have a few more things to say about this very soon the surface is expected to have a lower melting point than the bulk right because atoms are freer and therefore when you give temperature there is a chance that atoms would actually break free and cause that means go random do not sit in the crystalline order and therefore, we can think of it as having being molted. An important point of course, note is that though we expect the surface to melt at a lower temperature um, as far as current experimentations go and current understanding goes uh, it seems that the whole nanoparticle melts at the simultaneously at the same temperature and not layer by layer. Therefore, uh, uh, for now we will assume that there is something called a melting point which is the bulk melting point. There is a melting point for a nanoparticle of different sizes and as we decrease the size of the particle the melting point decreases as shown in the curve below. That means, that you have melting point which is there is a depression in the melting point as we make the particle size smaller. Now, using this example of gold suppose that we are below the melting point at say a temperature T 1. Now, this is my temperature T 1 that means that now at this temperature for instance which could be about 1300 kelvin we are under cooled to about 37 kelvin we are about 37 kelvin below the bulk melting point and suppose a small crystallite of size r2 is equal to 5 nanometer forms in the liquid okay so now we note that the melting point of this crystal is 1200 kelvin so if you take a 5 nanometer particle which is sitting here the melting point of this crystal is somewhere here which is 1200 Kelvin which is also below the melting point of the bulk. Now, this crystal will melt away it is not going to sustain because for this small crystal which is 5 nanometer because we note that we are not we are at this delta T that means we are at a temperature T 1 let us note that once more we are at undercooling which is given by this temperature difference here. So, we are this undercooling which I call delta T 1 and at this undercooling delta T 1 suppose I form a crystallite which is 5 nanometer in size which is shown here its melting point will be close to about 1200 Kelvin and such a crystallite obviously, for such a crystallite I am above the melting point now because I am at T 1 which is here. And therefore, such a crystallite will tend to melt away now for if I I have to assemble a crystallite of about 15 nanometer which is R 1 here if that crystal has not to melt that means, suppose I make a crystal which is anything smaller like for instance a 10 nanometer crystallite 
or a fine nanometer crystallite such crystallites will melt away because we are I am sitting at T 1 which is above the melting point of such kind of nano crystals. And needless to say that assembling at R 1 size crystal which is say 15 nanometer approximately is going to be more difficult than assembling a 10 nanometer crystal or even more easier would be a 5 nanometer crystal. Therefore, this needless to say is much less probable and it is better to undercool even further so that the value of R star decreases and thus the mystery of the nucleation barrier vanishes and we can think of melting point is equal to the freezing point for a given size of the particle. So, this is an alternate analysis and the subtle point in this analysis to be noted is that now we are not only talking about a bulk melting point, we are talking about a melting point which is now size dependent that means I am talking about a particle of R 1 it is going to melt at a temperature T 1. If I am talking about a 10 nanometer particle it is going to melt at an alternate temperature which I can mark in this graph as here. So, this is going to melt somewhere between 1215 and 1300. Suppose I am at an even smaller particle then that will melt say a 5 nanometer particle will melt approximately at 1200. Therefore, when I am below my melting point and I assemble a small particle this small particle will tend to melt away say a 5 nanometer particle will melt at a temperature T 1 and therefore, I will have no growth or no crystallization. Suppose I may assemble a particle nano particle which is 10 nanometer and I am sitting again at 1300 degrees Celsius such a nano particle will also melt away. Therefore, I have to assemble a particle which is say about 15 nanometer which is close to R 1 and R 1 sized crystallite so that I can have solidification at temperature T 1. So, in an alternate perspective we are seeing that that the very fact that if I undercool more my R star decreases or the melting point decreases. So, therefore, if I am sitting at T 1 the chances that I will have actually solidification is small because I have to assemble this large crystallite, but if I go to and if I assemble any smaller crystallite it will melt away therefore, I have to go to a lower preferable that I undercool the system more. So, that I can uh, form at least a crystallite which is say 5 nanometer or 10 nanometer which is easier to assemble and if such a crystallite forms then I can have a solidification of the melt. And therefore, we have understand the T m is the heating of the bulk material and, and in cooling if we take into account size depends on melting point and if you do that everything sort of falls in place. That means, now I understand that melting point is not a fixed number that melting point which I call is melting point is actually for the bulk and then under cooling I am defining with respect to the bulk, but suppose I take size dependent melting points then I know a 5 nanometer particle as a different melting point than the 10 nanometer particle and therefore, sort of the mystery of the nucleation barrier vanishes. But nevertheless since literature uses this terminology we will stick to such a terminology to understand uh, the process of solidification or any phase transformation in which we have this process wherein nucleation and growth is involved. So, let us talk about the atomic perspective of nucleation and talk about the nucleation rate. Okay. The process of nucleation of a crystal from a liquid melt below the melting point obviously, the bulk melting point we have described so far is a dynamic one. Various atomic configurations are being explored in the liquid state some of which resemble their stable crystalline order and some of these crystallites are of critical size R star for a given delta T. And these crystallites can grow to transform the melt to a solid by becoming supercritical. Crystallites smaller than R star which are called embryos tend to dissolve or tend to melt dissolve into the melt or just vanish into the melt. As the whole process is a dynamic one we need to describe the process in terms of rate the nucleation rate. So, we have a dynamic process wherein various atomic configurations are being explored some of these atomic configuration resemble their crystalline state and these some of the nuclei are forming. So, suppose I have a melt here. So, some point of time I may have a small critical nucleus forming R star here. Then later on in a different point of time. So, this is a time T 1 this is T 1. Suppose I go to a later time T 2. So, this is T 2 by this time this R star particle would have grown and you may have one more nucleus R star forming here. At a later time T 3 this particle would have grown even bigger 
this particle would have grown a little larger, maybe I have one more nucleus forming here and even at a larger time T4 you will find that this would have grown to a larger size, this would have grown to a larger size, this would have grown maybe one more nucleus have occurred here. So, this whole process is a dynamic process and I need to describe this process of solidification in terms of a nucleation rate and a what you might call a growth rate. So, this nucleation rate which is written as d n by d t can be is the number of nucleation events per unit time. So, I take an interval of time and I see number of nucleation events I can calculate the nucleation rate. Also true nucleation rate is the rate at which crystallite becomes supercritical. To find the nucleation rate we have to find the number of critical size nuclei that means n star which is the number of critical size nuclei and multiply it by the frequency at which they become supercritical. So, at the any instant of time I need to locate how many of these nuclei are critical and then multiply it by the frequency at which they become supercritical and this I can think of as the nucleation rate. If the total number of particles and of course, I am talking about particles means this crystalline ordered regions of R star which can act like potential nucleation sites in the homogeneous and we are considering homogeneous nucleation for now is n t. Then the number of critical size particles given by the Arrhenius type function with the activation barrier delta g star. So, here I have a n t is the total number of what you might call potential nucleation sites and given the fact that these potential nucleation sites is connected to the number of um, n star which is the number of critical size nuclei by the activation barrier given by the Arrhenius function. So, I can write n star equal to n t exponential minus delta g star by k t that means larger the activation barrier then smaller will be the number of these uh, potential nucleation sites which act like actual critical size nuclei. So, in this slide I am trying to define a nucleation rate which is number of nucleation events per unit time and I need to do so because the whole process of solidification or phase transformation is a dynamic one in which at any point of time there are uh, some nucleation events taking place, some preformed nuclei are growing with time and at a later instant of time whatever the supercritical nuclei they have also grown and therefore, I need to track this kind of a dynamic event and to track that I need to define what you might call the nucleation rate of course, followed by a growth rate and the truly the nucleation rate is the rate at which a critical size nuclei becomes supercritical. That means, I have to find the rate at which the number of critical size nuclei and also multiplied by the rate at which or the frequency with which they become supercritical and to do so I take the total number of potential nucleation sites and then use an Arrhenius type of function e power minus delta g star by k t. So, therefore, function of temperature to arrive at the potential uh, or the number of critical size nuclei. Now, how does an critical size nuclei R star become supercritical? A critical size nuclei can become supercritical uh, by the jump of an atom which is around this critical size nuclei. Suppose I consider in the figure below, there are atoms which are shaded in grey, which I call say for instance approximately a critical size nuclei, nucleus this of course, a crude schematic. Then if any one of the atoms say in the liquid medium surrounding which is colored in a purple color or a violet color. So, this one of these atom jumps into the for instance into this uh, critical size nucleus then it would become supercritical. Okay. So, the potential number of atoms which can take this critical size nuclear to supercriticality is the number of atoms facing this uh, nucleus which is this number denoted by S star. Okay. So, S star is the number of atoms facing in the liquid which is facing the nucleus which can actually potentially jump into this uh, critical size nucleus and therefore, taking it to super criticality. So, I have a critical size nucleus R star, S star is the number of atoms which surround it and if the lattice vibration frequency is new that means, if all these atoms are vibrating with the frequency new and the activation barrier for an uh, barrier for an atom facing the nucleus uh, that means, an atom belonging to S star to jump to the nucleus uh, to make it supercritical is delta H t. Therefore, this is delta H t is the enthalpy of activation delta H uh, the barrier which can take that means, that 
this atom sitting here around the critical nucleus R star for instance suppose I take this atom or an alternate atom here this atom has to overcome a barrier whose height is delta H d. So, that it becomes part of the critical size nucleus and when it becomes part of the critical size nucleus the nucleus would have become supercritical. Therefore, using this activation barrier delta H d I can find the frequency at which nucleus becomes supercritical due to atomic jumps writing that as nu prime S star into nu into minus delta H d by k t. So, I have two terms now to contribute to the nucleation rate the first term being to locate the number of critical size particles which we have done before which is n star and these number of critical size particles are in volume L volume L or volume V we can call it better still. So, in a volume V I can locate all the number of critical size particles and the frequency with which such kind of uh, crystallites become supercritical and that frequency nu prime depends on the lattice vibration frequency nu depends on the number of atoms which are potentially can be vibrated into the state and the activation barrier which again depends on Arrhenius kind of function which is on a exponential minus delta H t by k t. Therefore, now I can find out multiplying these two functions the rate at which my um, nucleation takes place. Therefore, I can write my nucleation rate as a product of two terms and as in the equation here. So, nucleation rate I can be written as n t s star nu exponential minus delta g star plus or minus delta h t by k t. Now, this is uh, therefore, we have arrived at a function which describes the nucleation rate and the important thing is to see that how this function behaves with progressive undercooling and this will tell us that how we can you know uh, monitor the nucleation rate with progressive undercooling. So, before we go into that let us summarize the previous uh, slide or the previous two slides wherein we are trying to understand nucleation rate from an atomic perspective we found that the nucleation rate is the important term because we cannot just work with numbers because we are talking about a dynamic process which is changing in time and therefore, I have to talk about a process which is the nucleation rate and we have seen this nucleation rate depends on two things number of potential critical nuclei and the rate at which this nuclei become supercritical by atomic jumps from the phase around to the product phase and this atomic jump depends on the uh, lattice vibration frequency the frequency with which these atoms in S star are vibrating and of course, they have to cross the activation barrier to join the product phase the gray phase and this implies that such a process is an uh, activated process and this implies that there is an Arrhenius kind of exponential function which would dictate uh, the rate at which such a process is going to take place. And since the first term is only numbers per unit volume the second term brings in the time quantity and it is important note that this lattice vibration frequency is very large about 10 power 13 per second. So, multiplying these two I get my nucleation rate and the next thing I need to do is of course, track this nucleation rate as a function of the undercooling.